Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Erin, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, And, um, hi, uh... My sobriety date is April 30th, 2016. I have a home group. It's Empire Way, which I think is a pretty great meeting, and I'd highly recommend anybody go there. Um, I have a sponsor, and she has a sponsor. Um, So I'm just going to share a little bit of what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. So um, let's see what it was like. Uh, was not great. Um, <laughs> so I I grew up in like a really it was a it was a pretty good home. My parents were great parents. Uh, they got divorced when I was two, so I just grew up with that. Um, they were loving. They gave me attention. They really were good parents. Um, it got chaotic at times, but but they were pretty good um, and. My mom was a single mom and a teacher, and I very quickly became, I was able to always associate well with adults, but not so well with my peers. Like whenever I was with my peers, I just always felt like I was out of place. Um, I was uncomfortable. I didn't know how to fit in. And I can, and I could talk to adults like nobody's business. I just knew how to engage with adults. But when it came to talking to people my own age, I was awkward. I was uncomfortable all growing up. Um, And when I was 15, my mom took me to a family Bible camp. And I was out at the sand dunes with some kids. And my brother told me I could not go do whatever these kids were doing. And so I said, I'll show him. I do what I want. I didn't know what these kids were doing. And that was the first time. Um, that was the first time that I got high and that was the first time that I was comfortable around my peers. Um, and I just, I knew that that was something that I had to do as often as possible. Uh, shortly after it wasn't something that was very feasible. And so shortly after, um, I found alcohol, which was a little bit easier to come across. Um, and And it was the same, it was that same feeling of ease and comfort and fitting in and feeling comfortable with people my own age. It was the first time, other than that time at family Bible camp, that I I had ever experienced that. Uh, I felt like I belonged. I felt like nobody could tell me that I wasn't supposed to be there. Um, For the first time, I wasn't afraid of being found out. Like, they would all figure out that I didn't really fit in, and I, I wasn't really the person that I presented myself to be. Um, And so a lot happened, but pretty much all that matters is that from that time on, I was doing whatever I needed to do. It was really like, so I think I had my first drink and I smoked pot for the first time when I was 15. And by the time I was 18, Uh, My parents had sent me to rehab. I turned 18 at a treatment center. Um, I tried to run away multiple times from a pretty loving family. Um, And I had had a job as a nanny, which I lost when I proceeded to not pick up that girl from school one day uh, because I think I decided I was going to just run off and go do whatever I wanted, wherever I wanted with a group of my friends, which we didn't make it far. I lived in Kirkland and we made it not even out of the city limits before the police were called, and uh, I was sent back home. So that was pretty much, that was the beginning of my drinking career, and really mainly the end of my drinking career. When I got out of treatment, um, I, first of all, I had no idea. Like, I, I did steps one through four in rehab. I had no idea what they were talking about with any of that. It did not make sense to me at all. My brain was just so scattered. Um, And so I came out of rehab. I told my parents I wasn't going to drink for 
six months until I graduated high school. And then I was going to go ahead and live my life, move out, and my drinking. This was my thinking at the time. Once I moved out, my drinking would no longer impact them. Um, so I went to a party a week after getting out of rehab and, um, and proceeded to get drunk because that's what I do. Like when I'm on my own, I will drink every single time. Um, but I had made this promise to my parents. So I went to an AA meeting. I didn't tell them I drank. In fact, I didn't tell anybody I drank. I went to an AA meeting, um, and I sat my butt at the East Side Alano Club in Bellevue, and I made a bunch of friends, and I was there before school, after school, and during lunch. Um, and it was just like trying to force myself to stay sober through osmosis, I guess. Um, it it worked for a little while because as I was going to the meeting, um, I had a lot of friends who would tell me, things like, oh, well, maybe you should get a sponsor. Actually, it was a guy I was, I don't know if I was dating him or if I wanted to date him, but he said you should get a sponsor. So I was like, okay, uh, I will get a sponsor. And she said, meet me at my house every Saturday or Sunday. I don't quite remember. Uh, and we worked through the steps and, um, and I did it. Like I did whatever was asked of me. Uh, my friends and I, we would sit there at the meeting and nobody would show up to chair the meeting. And so we would, we'd be like, okay, well, all secretary, you chair. None of us knew anything about staying sober. We all had like a couple months. Um, if we were lucky, it was somebody with a sponsor who was chairing. It was a disaster, but we just like held tight to each other and just did whatever older people would tell us to do. Um, and it worked, it worked for three years, I think, um, until I decided that I had gotten what I needed out of AA. I didn't really need AA anymore. And, um, I met a guy who drank and so I just stopped going to meetings. I didn't drink for another five years. Uh, I still participated in sober events. Um, but I just, I fell out of touch with AA. I wasn't my sponsor that I had. She got drunk. I got a new sponsor. That sponsor ultimately got drunk. Um, and what ended up happening was shocker. Uh, I drank. So I had, I think I was coming up on seven or eight years. This is my pattern. So I have six years of sobriety right now and I'm, or no, I don't. That's five. I have five. I was doing the math. That's wrong. I have five years of sobriety. I'm not at six. Um, but that like that six, seven, eight scares the crap out of me because that's where I start to think that I have it figured out. That's where I start to think like my life is good. These other things that I have in my life now, because I got sober, because I work the steps, because I have a sponsor, because I'm of service to others, like those become more important than AA and I inevitably go back out. Um, and I really don't want to do that this time. So I'm really working to like, just stay in it no matter what. Um, so anyway, I drank, uh, I actually, this is going to sound lame, but I, um, smoked pot for a month thinking that it would be better. Like it was pretty horrible. I used to love it as a kid. I, uh, and I hated it. Like it was awful. It was everything that I hated. And I'm like, it's going to get better. This is going to get better because I am an alcoholic. That is how my mind thinks. Like if I keep trying, I'll get back to that feeling of comfort and ease. Um, and it didn't. So new year's Eve hit and I was like, okay, well I'll just, I'll, I'll have a drink at a bar. And I proceeded to get hammered and was passed out by 4 30 PM on new year's Eve of 2010. Um, and so I, I was like, this isn't working. It's not going to work. I came back into AA, uh, that actually took some time. I was playing sober softball and that kind of helped bring me back into AA. Um, and I, I don't, I don't even know, but, uh, regardless, like I came back into AA I had an awesome sobriety date of one, 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 one. It was rad. 
Uh, I was never going to lose that sobriety date. Uh, and then, and I was, at first I wasn't, I actually wasn't super involved in AA. I was a schoolaholic, I guess. I was getting my master's degree and I was like, I'm just going to do this. There was this lady that I saw and I'm like, I really want her to be my sponsor, but I know she's going to ask me to go to meetings and like do service and really be sober and not just not drink. Uh, so I waited until I was done or almost done with my master's program and asked her to be my, my sponsor. Um, and she has proven to be an amazing sponsor. Uh, and, and I started working the steps again. Um, and I got Empire Way. That's when Empire Way became my home group. They had cookies. I think the first meeting I went to, they had a dessert potluck, and it was the most amazing thing I had ever experienced in the world. And, uh, and that, that, that was all I needed at the time. And my sponsor was there. So those were the things that like checked off my list of this is a good meeting. Um, and, and what? Oh, so I worked, I, we started working the steps. She had me get involved in service. Um, I showed up to Empire Way just every Monday and Wednesday, no matter what, um, I think, <laughs> and, uh, and that was, and that, that was great. Like I had everything I got involved. I got involved in like mediocre service, uh, but any service is service. So it works, but I just did what was asked of me. Um, and I really like, I felt at home. I felt comfortable. I did, I did the steps. I did the work. I didn't hate who I was because ultimately underlying all of this is an inability to, to be okay with who I am, knowing what I've done. Like when I shared that with somebody else, um, almost all of it was somebody else. Uh, it was enough. So then in 2016, 20, yeah, 2016, I was dating this guy. I was in this super abusive relationship, uh, and I, I smoked pot and uh, thought it was medicinal. Thought I was just doing like I just I justified it, and I said it was medicinal, and I said like I was in a really bad place and I needed help, and it's okay. And I was still going to meetings, and I was lying about my sobriety date without but I justified it. So in my head, I didn't think I was lying. And every time I thought about it, I would just shove it back. Like, don't think about it. Cause if you think about it, you have to do something about it. Uh, and there's a lady at that meeting who would always talk about her experience smoking pot while in AA. And I was like, and every time I thought she was talking about me, I was like, this lady knows, she knows my secret. Uh, and one time I was at, a speaker meeting, the Magnolia speaker meeting. And, uh, it was two years into my second sobriety date. I was still lying about my sobriety date. Um, and I just had this moment of, I can live, I can live in this lie for the rest of my life and I can maybe drink again and maybe not drink again, but not live up to my full potential and always be trapped by this lie that I have. Um, and I told my sponsor that night, like I smoke pot, um, and I was afraid that I was going to be disowned by all of AA for lying about my sobriety date for the second time in a row, because I had also lied the first time I came in. Uh, and it was the most just opening, I don't know, moment in my life. Like she said, that's okay. That's what we do. What's your real sobriety date? Uh, and, and I just, it changed everything. Like that was my deepest, darkest secret. And today I don't have to be a secret. I don't have to, like, there's no part of my life that I won't happily share with somebody else. If I think it will help them in some way. Um, I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to be terrified of someone finding me out. And I feel like I fit in. I feel like I belong here. Uh, I continue to be of service. I continue to show up when I'm asked to, uh, um, like tonight. <laughs> um, and I am, a, I'm in a little bit of fear right now, honestly, but that's okay. Uh, just cause I'm here in front of all these people. Um, and, 
things like COVID hit and things shut down and life went wild. And even today, like things are still super uncertain and there's a lot happening in my work life, in my personal life. Um, but I get to show up and I don't have to be afraid of what that means for anything. Uh, because I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. And with that, my 15 minutes is up. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chanel. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm pretty nervous, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, to start with, my sobriety date is 6 19 so I have a little over two and a half years. Um, it's not my first time in recovery. I actually started trying to get sober with AA at the end of 2013, so um, it's been a long journey. I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, for me, my alcoholism started pretty early. I grew up in a dysfunctional family. Um, alcohol was a part of that, and there was some mental health stuff and a lot of things, and it just wasn't a super happy environment. Um, and I never really felt like I, I fit in. Um, it's one of the first things when I came to meetings that I really related to was that feeling of something just being wrong, I guess, with me all the time, and that I was different somehow. Um, the first drink I had technically was foam off like my dad's beer when I was maybe four. Um, the first time that I actually um, really felt the effects of alcohol was nine. Um, I was at a wedding and it was champagne and it was not being monitored very closely. Um, it's kind of like fortunately, unfortunately, I had enough to start to enjoy it and then I got caught eventually it got, and it got taken away, which. I didn't even really get like the bad effects of alcohol, so it stuck in my mind even more as something that I wanted again. Um, but despite that, I was a pretty, I was a pretty good kid up until like my junior year of high school. Um, I tried really hard. I thought if I was good enough, I think that um, eventually things would work out for me. Um, that my family would be better that I'd feel like I finally fit, like something, like if I just tried harder, that's kind of my solution to everything. I'm just going to try harder. Um, and that's an exhausting way to live. So when I started drinking more regularly, um, it was just, it was so much peace. It was like exhaling for the first time after holding my breath and rigidly trying to control everything and make everything okay and be good enough. And all of a sudden I was, good enough. Um, that's what it felt like for me. Um, I didn't feel awkward. I felt like I could talk. I felt like I was funny. I mean, it's like what a lot of people say, but I was funnier, prettier, smarter. Everything was okay. Um, and so that kind of dovetailed and, or that kind of led to me, um, it started spiraling pretty quickly. I ended up in foster care too at that time in my life. And I was pretty angry and I just went hard um, for the next couple of years, um, started incorporating some other substances, started drinking a lot um, until I was um, a little bit past my 19th birthday and I was dating, um, my boyfriend also had this disease and ended up um, losing his life to it. Um, wasn't directly, it wasn't like that, but it, um, he ended up passing away, and it's the first time I kind of really got hit really hard with anything in life, and at first I was just drinking, because I used to drink at things, like I drink at my feelings, I drink at people. Um, anyway, so at first I just went harder, I didn't really want to be alive, I just went, um, and then I ended up, I met somebody who was in, um, a Christian group at the time. Um, and I'd had some like messed up experiences with religion, so I'm not sure why this appealed to me, but they had a softball team and I, I'd like to play softball. Um, so I ended up on this Christian team and I got sober ish, shall we say, for a year and a half, two years, which later on would mess with me in terms of identifying as an alcoholic because like, then why was I able to do that? But, um, you know, people were nice to me for the first time in my life. Um, I was trying, I did have a higher power concept of sorts, um, and that was all well and good, and I got into some cult-like religion stuff because I felt like it was okay and I belonged, um, 
until unlike AA, uh, this group didn't allow for your own concept of God. And when I began to have questions and doubts and disagree, I was essentially kicked out of the group. And I was, I got into college, I was a junior, and um, really went right back to where I was when I started. Um, and back, like backtracked, like when I started, one of my first parties, I remember this, um, <laughs> the first time I had really access to just a large amount of whatever alcohol I wanted that was there as a teenager. And so for whatever reason, I filled like a red solo cup with um, amaretto, which is a weird choice, but uh, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. So I downed this, uh, like downed this whole cup of amaretto. And then I started drinking beer right afterward. And I got very sick <laughs> pretty quickly um, and threw up all over somebody's backyard and woke up in a basement wearing different clothes um, at like one in the morning and started drinking again with everybody else. And that's kind of like, it's just a predictor of how my drinking was going to go. Um, but anyway, picked back up drinking, uh, went right back to where I was. I ended up getting a degree in social work so it, and a job. And I was a case manager and I was trying to help all these people manage their lives. Meanwhile, like I'd go home and drink every night I stopped using some of the other substances. So I thought I was okay. I was just drinking. So I was, that was better, I guess. Um, and it just became, my world got smaller and smaller. I mostly drank by myself because I got into less trouble when I drank at home and I spent less money. Um, I started drinking beer because I blacked out less when I drank beer versus liquor. It's doing that. And it just got so it was just a repetitive cycle day in, day out. And um, I would just, every morning, I'd wake up sick and late for work and everything else and throw on barely, probably not clean clothes and swear I wasn't going to do it that night. And by 4 o'clock, when I'm about to think about getting off work, there would always be a reason. Um, it was a good day. It was a bad day. I really liked when it was raining. I don't know. I like to contemplatively sit and like feel my feelings while I drank when it was raining. I, I don't know. But um, it's like, it's kind of an emo person. Still am, I guess. But uh, I will try to speed this up because I want to get to recovery. Um, but anyway, I went from being a social worker to my drinking progressed to the point where I couldn't keep a job. And I ended up walking back into the homeless drop-in center I worked at as a client because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And that proceeded the next five years of being in and out of AA, um, which a therapist had recommended. That's how I started going. Um, but I really thought my problems were so much more like, yeah, I drink alcoholically, but like I do that because I have all these other issues. It was kind of like how I got stuck. Um, and hit some really low bottoms and came out here to Seattle, essentially running away from my life. Uh, my plan was that I didn't think I could exist sober, that it was too painful, that it was too, that I was too messed up. It was never going to be okay. Um, and I just couldn't, but maybe I could do less damage if I just, you know, I try not to mention other substances, but um, like weeds legal out here. I'm just going to do a lot of that and I'm going to try not to drink. Um, and that was kind of my plan as I ran away from my life with like a backpack and took a plane ticket to Portland. Um, until I, I ended up hitchhiking, coming up here, I was in a hotel in Aurora, um, and just trying, and I immediately went back to drinking, because that's what my favorite thing is. Um, I couldn't just, couldn't just smoke weed. Um, immediately started drinking again, and I'm in a hotel, getting as messed up as I can, and I, I can't even enjoy, like, I can't shut my brain off. I'm doing all the things, and it doesn't work anymore. And um, anyway, so I got, tried to get sober here. I got a little time. And then my last, um, my last drink actually wasn't my worst drink really. Um, it, I don't really know why, um, for me, it, it was the end. Nothing that terrible happened. I got in an argument with a guy and I did jump out of an Uber on 45th, but it was not for me that bad of a night. Um, and actually that wasn't even night. It was afternoon, but, um, anyway. You know, I came to the next day and I just, I knew I could keep repeating this cycle and I never, I wanted to die, but I never really had the guts to kill myself and drinking just was taking me down, but very slowly. And I, I mean, I wanted to die and it wasn't, I could just keep repeating the cycle, building my life, life back up a little bit and destroying it um, until I eventually died or 
I could try one more time, but I kind of knew I just had to make this choice, and I don't really know. I think it was a gift of desperation, a moment of clarity. Um, I don't know, but I went back in, and I, I went, my first meeting back actually was in this building. It was New Beginnings. It was a women's meeting at 10 a.m., um, and I... I just did everything this time. You know, my times before in AA, like I would go to meeting, I would do parts of it, sometimes a lot of it, but I never really did everything. Um, and my kind of my thought was, I'm going to give it one last shot. I'm going to do all of it and see see if it works. Um, and, you know, I'm sober. I never had this much time before. And like, I, I mean, before I got out here, I hadn't kept a job for longer than six weeks for over five years. I am leaving a job I like for a job that I want more um, next week. So it's just all of these things. And um, it was really uncomfortable. The first, it's still really uncomfortable, if I'm honest. Like, the first year was kind of excruciating. I really struggled to to make friends, to trust people. Um Honestly, I used to go, uh, my first home group, I used to, like, cry afterward. But I didn't have a car at first, I had a moped. So I'd, like, drive my moped around the block and then, like, cry. Like, I don't know. Because, like, I saw all the togetherness of other people and I wanted that, but I didn't know how to get it. And I was, like, and it hurt. And I would go and I, I'd just see it and I'd want it. I'd, be, I'd put myself in proximity to it, but then I would just, like, leave and <laughs> cry <laughs> uh, on my moped. Um until I eventually, I, I did get a service position pretty quickly because I was trying and I was outside a meeting and I looked, I was smoking and this woman came up and she asked me what was wrong. And I said something about just being lonely or wanting to be part of, or I was honest for whatever reason. And she's like, well, why are you out here and there and there? And it was a business meeting and I went in and I got, they called it the door wrangler position, which is, um, letting people in, you know, but I got to to know people. And that was kind of the beginning for me. Um, and it was a lot of doing what I didn't want to do constantly. Um, uh, and so that was about, so I had about nine months when the pandemic started and I'm really thankful that I was able to get that traction before that happened. Um, cause it's, yeah. I don't know. There's just like life still happens. At least that's my experience as a sober person. Um, and somehow we learn how to handle that, which for me, like I always felt like there's this rule book or something that other people got that I didn't get. And mm -hmm. like, I didn't know how to live life. And it's kind of weird because there actually is a book in AA that sort of tells us how to live life. And it's like other people don't actually have that. And I'm grateful that I do have, have a book. Um, I don't know. But um, what else to say? Uh, yeah, so I, I have, and I got a sponsor and a service position in a home group. Um, and yeah, I got through the pandemic somehow. Um, I also got a bunch of outside help. That's a big part of my story, you know, and for me, it's peeling layers. Like there's just a lot of layers and I really like to use other things to not feel my feelings. So drinking is my biggest one. But if you take that away from me, you know, I had to deal with an eating disorder. I've had to file for bankruptcy because uh, spending money feels really good to me when I don't want to deal with things. Um, and I'm hard on myself. So then I'm like, well, I'm a failure. So I might as well like, kind of like I'm going to screw up. I might as well screw everything up because that's just sort of how I do life. But um, learning how not to do that has been kind of what my journey has been about. And in the last, um, I don't know, six weeks, I had a sponsee once before, but for like literally two weeks and she didn't stay sober, but uh, I have a sponsee again. And it's been great to work the steps with somebody else and to hear somebody else repeat all of the same fears that I had that I would tell my sponsor thinking I was the only one that I was different and why this wouldn't work. And then I'm hearing this other person say it and kind of watching the lights come on a little bit. And that's crazy to me. And, um, and it can be like such a both and I guess like things are still really, we're still in a pandemic and sometimes it's still really hard and I'm beginning to work through a lot of trauma stuff and like in therapy and do all these things. And that's hard, but I can still show up. And like, that's what AA has allowed me to do. Like, and that's what keeps me sober. Like my sponsee apologized the other, the other day. And she's like, I, 
she was in a meeting with me and I'd shared some things and she's like, well, I didn't know you were like going through all this and I shouldn't bother you. And I'm like, no, that's how I get through all this. Please bother me. Um, please, please bother me. And like, I did not until I started sponsoring believe like my sponsors would tell me they I helped them more. And I'm like, no, no way. I'm a burden all this stuff. But oh my God, that's how I stay sober. Like it's showing up when I don't want to and getting out of my head and listening to somebody else. Um, yeah. And I don't have like 10 seconds left. So uh, I don't know if any of that made any sense, but I'm really grateful to be here tonight, especially in the same building. It feels like kind of coming full circle. So that's all I got. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ian and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually my first time at a speaker meeting. Like it's just a speaker meeting. So I'm a bit nervous as usual. I beg your pardon. Um, my home group is either Last Chance or Shanty Treasures or Valerie Beginners, depending on my mood that day. So I'm, I'm involved with all three of those groups. My sponsor is Jason, and I blame a lot of my sobriety on him. So starting out with what was it like? Uh, I'm a, I was a late bloomer to drinking. And uh, I'm actually a pretty pretty high bottom drunk, and pretty I feel myself pretty lucky. But it was, you know, I drank since I was 21. And there might have been signs. I don't know. I didn't drink a lot, but when I, I drink, I did not drink frequently. But when I drank, I tended to drink a lot. But it wasn't until my early 40s, no, maybe late 30s, where I started drinking in earnest. Um, I decided that I I lived a life of fear. Fear was such a part of my life and uh, really insecure. And I decided I wanted to do something about that. So I started putting myself out there, hanging out with some new people. Uh, I had some friends who were part of the Burning Man community. So I started hanging out with them and uh, started going out just about every night. You know, beer, you know, beer Monday, beer Tuesday, beer Fridays, potluck Thursdays, whatever. And doing events and just drinking more and more frequently. Uh, you know, it started with good, good intentions. It was, you know, and part of it was, as described in the book, I felt like I had arrived, you know. I was a lot more sociable. Uh, I was having fun with people. I was a lot more comfortable. You know, my, my insecurity and natural shyness was dissipated by the uh, by the alcohol and then also some you know not to a large extent but i i did did drugs too various kinds um guess it was just kind of an exploration process uh later on i uh ended up in some unhealthy relationships and it turned from drinking as socialization to drinking as an escape i ended up drinking at home every night i just i I'd get home from work and I'd look forward to that first shot. Generally, my, my drink of choice was vodka because I tended to be gluten-free and they didn't have as bad of a... that You can get some gluten-free vodka. So, um, beer and I don't always get along as much as I liked it. But uh, I looked forward to that first shot and, uh, you know, I'd end up drinking, drinking until I went to bed. Um, started blacking out. Uh, would wake up like at 3 a.m. and wondered where the takeout food that was sitting in front of me came from. And, you know, I finally figured out that I kind of had a problem. Uh, you know, I was drinking at work, too, in the mornings. I'd bring my little six-ounce flask. I didn't like to drink and drive. I, I'm, I'm sure I did. But <clears throat> uh, generally speaking, I'd get up in the morning, go to work, and once I'm at work and I'm in my own little office in the back room, I'd down that little six ounce flask and that would usually last me at least throughout the day but by the time I was ready to get home I was ready to be under the influence again I just didn't want to deal with life and the pain and um, but I'm not sure I remember exactly what it was that made me realize that I had a problem uh, I've always been in therapy I've been in therapy for a long time and finally admitted to my therapist I had an issue and I stopped drinking. I, I, it was my dry year, I guess you would say. I wasn't going to AA. And I was in a meeting last night, and someone else described their period, their dry period as empty. And that, I'd have to say that really fits my experience. Um, I didn't drink. I, I did occasionally smoke pot and stuff. Uh, but during that year, I wasn't going to AA. I just wasn't drinking. 
and it just meant that I had to deal with life a lot more and you know found my way found myself just trying to escape in other ways you know maybe it was tv or just books or sleeping or whatever i i could do to just not not deal with things it was a pretty painful year um went away on vacation and i just kind of had a a, a call it a relapse over the weekend but i drank over the weekend and that that told me two things one is that you know, I'm not going to stay sober by myself. And two, that I really liked alcohol. Um, you know, the minute I drank, I realized I just wanted more and more. And uh, I came back, and that's when I finally started going to AA. Um, so a lot of pain emotionally, too, about that time. My memories overlap and stuff. So I uh, I started sitting in on a, a couple of AA groups, and for the for the beginning number of months. Uh, oh, did I? I never said. I've, I've got about two and a half years of sobriety, by the way. So I should have said that. Um, started sitting in on a couple different AA groups, mostly just sitting in the back and listening. You know, heaven forbid that I want to share unless I really had to. It just terrified me. Um, and that's how it went for a while. I slowly started recognizing the faces, got to know people, and eventually some guy came up to me and said, hey, dude, do you have a sponsor? I'm like, uh, I don't think so. I said, now you do. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, let's meet and talk and see how this works. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, from then on, I started meeting with my sponsor weekly, and I still do, and started working the steps. And it was a slow process. But... Uh, that's, uh, I think that's really when things really started to turn around for me. Um, I can't say that I, you know, I went into the steps trying to do my best. You know, at the time, I, I guess I don't know how to describe it. It's, you know, I wasn't all there. I didn't really understand what I was doing fully yet, but I was doing it. Um, just to, uh, to try to deal with life. And and I think that's one of the, on, on the, the, the quick aside here, is that's one of the, the, the best things I found about AA is not only does it help me to stop drinking, but it helps me have a better life, you know, to deal with the things that uh, I started drinking for in the first place, not just to not drink, but to move forward. And the steps help, help me to start that process. It's... Uh, I just have little thoughts because I get distracted easy. Um, you know, I didn't have all the answers, but I started working on it. I've, I think, much to my shame, I've been late growing up. You know, I've been a kind of immature, self-centered, and I think that led to some of my insecurity and led to my drinking. Um, and the steps have also helped me start growing up. You know, I can't play the victim card anymore, not if I really want to follow the steps. Uh, you know, I got to own my, my faults, my responsibilities, my imperfections, and to try to, to move forward and, and do my best with those that I can. Uh, that's sort of where I am today. You know, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of learning to, for me, it's a matter of learning to not run away, uh, to try to maintain relationships, to try to be truthful. Um, I was even, even, even though I had stopped drinking, I was still pretty heavily influenced by fear. You know, I'd worry about, you know, let's say I'm at a restaurant, I'd worry about what the next, per, the next table over would think about what I'm drinking or something like that. Pardon me, mouth gets dry. So, continue to work the steps, slowly grow. I have to say, sometimes I felt frustrated because I felt like I didn't really see, see much going on. But my sponsor was, was, was helpful and supportive, you know, and, and helped give me perspective. Uh, and as I look back, I don't necessarily see the changes day to day, um, but I can look back over time and I can see the changes in my life. 
you know, and I'm learning to trust, which is something that's always come difficult for me. And I'm learning to trust when other people tell me that they see changes because I don't necessarily see them. I'm not one of the, I, I never had the, you know, lightning bolt from heaven, higher power experience. It slowly just kind of developed as, I, as I've grown. And um, it's hard and also delightful. Um, it's not easy to face yourself, I'm sure you all know, and it's still hard. But, you know, there's hope and got a lot of work to do. Still got a lot of growing up to do. Uh, you know, the, the self-applied dope slaps, and it, good-naturedly, not beating up on myself, but uh, um, that's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's you know, just laughing at things. And the more I grow, the more I've been involved. Um, you know, the, of the, 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 the groups that I mentioned, you know, um, I learned, uh, for, you know, first I'd start to speak up at meetings. You know, later on, I took some positions. You know, the I had, you know, I wasn't fully a year yet when the when the um, pandemic hit. You know, so transitioning to online, that was that was unique. You know, to those who've gotten sober just online and not been in person meetings, man, more power to you. Uh, But I got involved in opening those up. You know, I'm a treasurer for a group now. I uh, am the secretary for another group. And for another group, I'm just, all I do is open up the meeting, you know, so make sure the Zoom meeting is on. You know, some of the meetings I attend are in person, some are on Zoom. And maybe I'm, I'm, I'm I tend to be one of the rare people, I think, that I like them both. You know, uh, so. One of the things I do to stay sober is just to keep working the steps in all my affairs. And that was, I mentioned it earlier, that uh, it's really helped me move forward in life, working the steps, not just to stop drinking, but to be a better person. Uh, the little steps I've done, I think, lately is, is trying to introduce more of a prayer life. It took me almost two years to... Uh, get a decent prayer life going where I could get up in the morning and pray at night. And it's still hard. I still don't necessarily want to. It's one of the things where I kind of have to force myself to take the action, and generally I'm glad I do. But uh, I've been a procrastinator a lot of my life, and that isn't always helpful. So the re you know reading books and growing is my sponsor is continually encouraging me to do that, and that's really helpful. Uh, I'm still somewhat spoiled and selfish. You know, I, sadly, AA has helped me to identify that. It takes a long time, I think, to change some of the patterns in life. Uh, but now I can actually recognize them, and I can catch myself when I'm in, in certain behaviors. And the difference is, what do I do when I catch myself? Do, am I just trying to escape? Or do I actually try to turn to the step to, to deal with it? And, uh, you know, I'm not perfect. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. I don't know that it's been, quite been 15 minutes. I can maybe pad this out. So, <laughs> back in 1956, there we're growing some cat. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's where I am. Like I said, it's it's still hard, but not a bad hard. Um, I am I am grateful for AA because it's done what a lot of the rest of my life has not done, which is to help me start to grow up, to deal with life, to face these issues, to take responsibility, to not treat myself like crap. Um, and it's two step for me. It's two steps forward, one step back. You know, I continually fall into issues. I'm reading a book now called The Spirituality of Imperfection. And uh, that's I'm, I'm still probably at one-third into the book, and that's that's been delightfully refreshing in that it, it kind of gives you permission to be imperfect and still be human and still be spiritual. And that's 
It's an amazing thing. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm an alcoholic. I have a sobriety date of November 10th, 2015, and I am so grateful. I will always be forever grateful for that day. Um, uh, thanks, Teresa, for asking me to be of service tonight. It's always such an honor to participate in your recovery in this way, um, and I didn't know about this meeting, so thanks for that. Um, I'm so grateful to be sober. When I got here, my life was just a dumpster fire. I was um, 28 or 29. I think I just turned 29. I was homeless. Um, I was unemployable. I had just, you know, uh, my alcoholism had taken me very low. And when I got here, I think I knew that I was alcoholic, but I had no real understanding of that I was living with alcoholism and really what that meant for me in my life. And, you know, I don't know if I was born alcoholic or how that works, but I think that I've always lived with some type of internal spiritual maladjustment, always. You know, I've always felt really. Um, separate from people. I always had kind of trouble in relationships and um, it was like just my natural state was kind of like anxiety and depression and fear. And as I got older, I kind of developed this like really um, demanding and controlling need for acceptance and approval from other people. I just never felt okay. Like I could never wrest satisfaction out of life. Like I was just always restless and irritable and discontent and um, I had a really loud head all the time who was, you know, it was just this critic was always telling me how I wasn't enough and I, you know, wasn't pretty enough or wasn't smart enough. And, um, you know, it was just exhausting. And, uh, I, by the time I found alcohol, I was probably around the age of 15. And at that time it wasn't about like drinking wasn't about escaping pain for me. I just wanted to be cool and fit in and I wanted to be popular, you know? So I started drinking and, um, and I wouldn't have guessed that alcohol was going to prove to be the solution for what was happening in my life and, you know, prove to be the solution to quiet down that voice. Um, I wouldn't have, would have never made that connection, but it was. And I think I started drinking alcoholically, you know, kind of from the first time I drank. I drank as often as I could after that, which wasn't very often. I was young, but um, I certainly drank as much as I could after that. And, you know, it progressed quickly for me. By the time I was probably 16 years old, people were like, eh, maybe you should quit drinking. Like, you get you get really weird and you cry a lot and, you know, like, you're just, you're not, you shouldn't drink. And um, every time I drank, I would black out and I would do these horrific things and people would tell me about them the next day. And I just couldn't believe, you know, these stories people would tell me. And it was so vastly different from the way I showed up on a normal basis. Um, and I think by the age or by the end of high school, I tried to quit drinking because my alcoholism was so out of control and I was able to see it. So I, uh, my dad had just died actually of alcoholism and, um, and I was able to quit. I stopped for three years. Now I was doing other substances every single day, but I didn't connect the two. I thought, well, I'm, I can't be alcoholic. I haven't drank for three years, but I was doing other stuff. Um, and you know, and that's just kind of how my life progressed. Things just continued to go, um, south for me. It was hard for me to keep a job because I'm drinking every day. And, um, it's like, you know, I was just, things were going south very quickly for me. Uh, throughout that time, I'll fast forward. I won't spend too much time on my drinking because it was just, it's hard to make anything really dramatic out of it. It was just one shit show after another. It was just one more job I got fired from, one more person I ripped off, one more time I got caught stealing, you know, it was just one more time I got kicked out. Another time I was homeless. It was just one dramatic thing after the other. Um, and fast forward to 2014 and, um, I had been sent down to rehab my eighth rehab down in California and, uh, had relapsed again. So I was now homeless on the streets of California and it was very different, right? Like being homeless in Seattle, I knew some people homeless in California. My life just got so dark and so scary. And, uh, I'll never forget where I was the last day of my drinking. I was living in this motel in Ontario, California, and um, it was disgusting and dingy and smelled, and I was uh, completely out of money. I had just sold my car that I had been living in, and, um, you know, I'd gotten a motel room for as long as I could afford and got as much alcohol and other things to hopefully kill me, and I didn't die. But I remember when I ran out of alcohol, um, I was faced with the truth about myself with a level of clarity that I, I'll never forget, or I hope I never forget. I've never forgotten to this day. And, um, you know, and I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was alcoholic and that I was going to die of my drinking. And prior to that, 
like I like I said, I had been to eight rehabs. Every time I went into rehab, I went in with this idea that I could quit. I just didn't want to. Like I, I knew my life was, you know, on fire, but I just thought, well, it's still kind of fun. And like, it's like I had so much ego around my alcoholism. I thought that I had something to say about it and I was still kind of in control. Um, but on that night, I just, I was just so faced with the reality of my situation. And I was able to get into rehab one last time. Um, and I remember I went in and I got into detox that night and I hit my knees and I started praying. And I don't know where that came from because I did not have a relationship with God. I certainly wasn't praying. And I mean, I really don't feel like that was of me. It, like felt like something pushed me down. And, um, and I had like a legit spiritual experience. I felt this peace come over me. I felt this sense of warmth and safety and I hadn't felt safe in many, many years. And I just, for the first time in a long time, felt like I was going to be okay. And for whatever reason, um, I got really willing in that rehab and all the other rehabs I had gone to, it was just, you know, count down the days. Okay. I got 10 more days. And I'm still calling all my friends on the outside and my drinking buddies. And, um, you know, I was just like counting down the days until I would leave. But this time my insurance was going to cover me for, uh, 30 days. And every single day I was outside that insurance lady's office begging, please let me stay here longer. Please keep me in. I'm going to die. And she was able to keep me in for four months. And then from there I went to transitional living. And then from there I went to sober living for a year and a half. And, um, and you know, and I got really willing, like I got a sponsor right away. I got really willing to do what you guys do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd been coming to Alcoholics Anonymous since the age of 18 and just never wanted what you had because I didn't think I needed it. And I just, I couldn't really understand or make sense of what was happening in these rooms. And I still, today, even though I've had like a full personal experience with what happens in these rooms, I can't explain it. You know, like it's a magic trick. The way we come into this room and what happens to us, it's unexplainable. Um, but yeah, I got a sponsor and in early sobriety, it was my early recovery looked like me being in five meetings a week. I was um, I got sober down in California. So we, my sponsor just threw me into service work and we were down on skid row volunteering once a month. We would take, um, meetings down to the mission, the midnight mission. And that was just such a cool experience. Um, you know, I had service commitments at almost every single meeting. I was hanging out with newcomers and even though I was super new, but I had more time than them. And it was just a really cool, um, experience. Um, at about a year and a half of sobriety, I met somebody and, um, ended up getting pregnant and moved to Arizona. So I'd made this big, huge move in early in sobriety. I think I moved around two years. Um, but I did what we do in early sobriety. I, again, you know, just went to a bunch of meetings, got connected, got a new sponsor, and I was able to stay sober through that. And um, it's such a cool thing because, you know, through coming into these rooms, like the change that occurs within us, the rearrangement that happens through the spiritual experience, like, um, that relationship started to go south really quickly. And, um, I got to do inventory through that process and I got to do like a whole year of inventory and I got to like understand beyond a shadow of a doubt that I could no longer stay in that relationship. And I got to leave that relationship without being haunted by my decision. And today me and that man have a beautiful relationship. We get to show up as a unified front for our daughter and, um, and that's not of me. Like I am resentful. I am uh, punishing, I'm a liar, you know, all those things. And you don't have good relationships with people when you show up like that. And I don't have to show up like that today. I, and it's not like I walk through life trying to not show up like that. Like that's been changed. And, you know, like God, like I'm not the same person physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally today. Like I've had this complete change within myself as a result of the work that we do in this program. And, um, so you know, I left, left Arizona and moved back home to Seattle with my daughter. And, um, and again, did what I did when I was new, you know, got connected, got a home group, got a sponsor. And, um, I moved literally a week before everything got shut down for COVID. So it was kind of a weird transition, but, um, even through that, you know, I've gotten to stay sober and it's, it's just such an incredible life today. And, um, you know, today, again, I, I get to show up and be a mom and I never, ever thought that I would get to have a child. Like, women who live the way that I did don't get to be moms. And if they do have children, they get taken away. And, um, I get to be a mom today and I'm a good mom today. I have a career today and I never ever would have thought that this life was possible for me. And I don't think a lot of people did, you know, people who knew me six years ago. Um, 
it's just such an incredible life that we get to live as a result of this. So um, I have five minutes, but I think that's kind of all I have. I'm super grateful to be sober and super grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.